Boston Harbor we set sail when it was blowing a devil of a gale with a ring tail set all about the mizzen peak and a rule Britannia bowing up the deep with the yo he ho to row row wind the loft and rum be low. The Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. In 2012, the Navy's Great Green Fleet, an initiative championed by the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, since 2009, conducted a demonstration of its abilities at the Rim of the Pacific exercise, one of the largest exercises in the world and featuring over 22 different nations. The ships and aircraft from the U.S. involved in the demonstration were entirely powered by alternative fuels, either nuclear or an advanced 50-50 biofuel blend made from used cooking oil and algae, combined with petroleum-based diesel or aviation fuel. This display marked an early effort by the Navy to address a potential serious operational difficulty, a fuel shortage. Nearly 200 years ago, Another effort was made by the Navy to address a fuel supply which might not always be available in copious quantities, wind. In the waning years of the War of 1812, development was rapidly underway for the first steam warship, the Demologos, later named the Fulton after its inventor Robert Fulton. Yet, why was the Navy so slow to adopt steam over the next 40 years? The Navy has had a love affair with steam since its inception. But the first 40 years of this relationship were relatively unhappy and, well, explosive. Dr. Scott Harmon will tell us a little bit more about the Fulton's development and the steam engine, but let's look at a couple events in the first 40 years of steam in the Navy. Authorized in 1814 by Congress, Fulton would not see service against the British in the War of 1812. This likely contributed to the failure of the U.S. Navy to adopt steam for several more decades. After several demonstrations, her innovative design was eventually put to use not as a warship, but as a barracks ship, and she blew up later in 1829 in a gunpowder explosion. The next U.S. steamship would change designs, shifting from the Fulton paddle wheel to the newly invented steam screw. However, Princeton too would face catastrophe during a weapons demonstration. John Erickson who helped design the Princeton and later the first steam-powered, turreted, ironclad warship, the USS Monitor, had designed an innovative new gun, the Oregon gun, to be used aboard Princeton. This gun, now on display at the Naval Academy and the subject of one of our future episodes, was copied incorrectly by the commander of Princeton, John Stockton. In fact, Stockton's design was thought to be an improved version. However, this gun would go on to explode, killing the Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Gilmer, and Secretary of State, Abel Upshur, along with others. This left another mark on Steam's history. So, for a variety of reasons, including budget cuts from a peacetime Navy, political opposition, and several mistakes, Steam failed to gain headway for quite a while in the Navy. However, it made great gains in the commercial sector. The Green Fleet Initiative of the U.S. Navy today is only in its infancy stages, and, like the adoption of steam in the Navy, it has faced setbacks and criticisms. We are closing in on the 200th anniversary of the first sea trials of the Fulton, but steam wouldn't truly be adopted by the Navy until nearly half a century later after its first trial. The commercial sector also had time, during the interval between Princeton and the Fulton, to fully perfect the technology and make it more affordable. But the Navy's openness to try new things led to some of the greatest warship innovations in history, resulting in a complete rewriting of naval tactical doctrine and changing the course of naval development forever. Perhaps someday, historians will look back at 2012 as the year where, like the shift from sail to steam, the U.S. Navy began its shift from petroleum-based fuels to other types of fuel. But if the history of steam is anything to judge the future by, it might take a while. We now go to Dr. Harmon. Today we are looking at the steam engine, revolutionized 
the motive power of ships, which for many years have been moved only by sail power. But the steam engine changed all that. Uh, here we have a model of what was called a working beam or a walking beam engine. Uh, you see the beam moving in the back. Uh, it's going up and down. It's driven by a, a steam piston. Uh, the lever changes, it goes through a crankshaft and turns the paddle wheel. And this made it possible for ships not to depend upon wind uh, to move. Ships could even go into the wind, which they could not in the days of sail power. Well, the United States Navy was an innovator in the use of steam power. And right here we have a model of the Demologos, or the Fulton One. And this is the first steam-powered warship in the world. And it was built by the United States. Uh, it was started at the end of 1814. We were still fighting the British uh, in the War of 1812. And the idea of this uh, ship, which I consider personally one of the ugliest ships ever built for the Navy, was that if there was no wind, and the British had blockading ships outside of New York Harbor, this ship, although it could only go about five knots, could steam out and attack those British blockading ships and they could not get away. Uh, this was rather revolutionary. Uh, it has a paddle wheel. The paddle wheel is in the middle of the hull. It's a catamaran hull, so you have two similar hulls, uh, a water chase going down the middle and the paddle wheel uh, in the center, on the center line. On one side, you see uh, four smokestacks. Uh, on uh, the other side would be the engine itself, so the steam was generated in the boilers where the smokestacks are, over to the engine, similar to the walking beam engine, and would drive the paddle wheel. Now this vessel was a double ender. It could go either direction equally slowly five knots, but as I say, that's pretty fast if you're not going anywhere because there's no wind. Uh, she could change the direction of her sails, she could change the direction of her paddle wheel and move out. Uh, she was almost impregnable because on the sides there was five solid feet of wood protecting the crew. So she could go out alongside uh, an enemy ship, uh, blast away at it with her big guns and move on to the next. Uh, fortunately, the war came to an end before Demologos was put into service. Uh, she remained in New York till uh, the 1820s when she caught fire, and like wooden ships at the time, fire was very deadly to them, and she burned, and we lost uh, this original vessel. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. Please join us for future podcasts as we look at the collections of the Naval Academy Museum.